lot of clients have asked me, how did I start the business and why did I start it? There's a guy in a yellow and black jumpsuit back in the 70s who was one of the biggest influences on this business. And you wouldn't think so, but uh, he fits into the business in a big way. And I'll uh, tell you who that guy was and how he fits in as we get along in the story. And so we started out as a very small business. I returned from the circus in, she needs her ball. I returned from the circus in 1997 and I'd been touring in Malaysia and Indonesia, Singapore. And I came back and I met um, a lady who wanted to have some children who were being homeschooled. And I was asked to design a program for these kids way back then. And you might not realize it, but when children are being homeschooled, uh, the government has to come out and sanction the program and they have to check over on it and make sure you know, it ticks all the boxes for the things that they're looking for. And it was a really interesting process for me because it was the first time in my life that I really suddenly had to reassess gymnastics and what it meant and whether the sport was actually foundational to all sports or not. I mean, at that stage in my life I'd only taught gymnastics, circus and martial arts. And I was thinking to myself, well, I can't really teach these five kids. I think there was uh, a couple of kids who were four, and there was five children in total, and the eldest was uh, nine at that stage. And I thought, well, I can't just teach them how to do a cartwheel, because I won't have the ability to socialise with other children. I won't be able to play tennis or basketball or those other things. So if I only taught gymnastics, it isn't really foundational to all sports. I had to really reinvent the sport of gymnastics and transform it into a new program and add in other elements really so that it would be so that the kids would have the be able to be included in, in when they uh, socialize with other children so I started to think about that and I really wanted to tra as I said transform gymnastics and make it accessible to a whole range of children but also make the sport of gymnastics practical so I was looking to do those two things. I wanted to add the body intelligence of gymnastics, the discipline of martial arts, I think the thrill and the skill of circus, um, you know, the problem solving of rock climbing, and just the general fun of children um, playing in the games that they would play at school, like down ball and, and um, four square and British Bulldogs, and, and the, the general fun of those sorts of sports, and add that into the program and it made me start to rethink that what I was going to teach them and voila, like magic, eventually we had this unique program and that's what the kids all do now. But the question is where did the idea to transform gymnastics come from? It came from that guy in the yellow and black jumpsuit and that guy's name was Bruce Lee. And it may sound like an obscure um, influence. I mean, I, my biggest influence in, in designing and creating the program wasn't another gymnast. And it wasn't necessarily someone from a, a, a sporting program that was involved with children. It was a, it was a, um, a Chinese martial arts artist who reinvented you know, martial arts in the 60s and 70s. At that stage, when you did a martial arts in the 50s and 60s and earlier, you chose one style and you stuck with it the whole time. You either did judo, taekwondo, uh, aikido, win chun, snake and crane technique, whatever you did. And you so you chose this one program and you stuck with it for life. But Bruce Lee was the very first person to say, I'm not going to do that. And there was a lot of backlash against him before doing that. But he said, I'm going to take what's useful from all the different styles and, and keep that and discard what isn't useful and applicable. And he created his own style called Jeet Kune Do. And as a, as a young lad in my 20s, that was probably my biggest influence, the, his idea for doing that. And that's how the Kids in Motion concept came around.
My second biggest influence was also came, came left of field. It was more to do with Bruce Lee really helped me um, sketch out the outline of the program, but it was somebody else uh, who came along and helped me colour in the lines when it came to designing the look, the feel and the images of the business. And again, I didn't go to other play centres or other sporting clubs to look for inspiration. I went to the flamboyant lead singer of Van Halen, none other than David Lee Roth. And, uh, So I said it was in 1997 and I went out to um, all sorts of school, at all, all sorts of people's houses and my idea was just, I just wanted to go out and wherever kids needed a helping hand I would go out. At this time a lot of schools were cutting their sporting programs so there wasn't as much funding for sport. Uh, the percentage of parents breaking up and the divorce rate was growing and so was the amount of time that uh, dads were being asked to work so the work hours were extending so for young boys who didn't come from a big family or didn't have sisters or brothers there were a lot of young boys and girls out there that didn't necessarily have a role model and someone who would jump in and teach them how to play sport so my when I started the business I really sort of had a sporting it was more like a sports tutor I had sports bag will travel and a bit like a you know, a French tutor or a maths tutor, and I went out to all different places. I went, drove to Essendon, I drove to, um, to out towards Puff and Billy, to Belgrave South. I even drove out to um, Mount Eliza. I remember one parent, um, she felt guilty that I would drive an hour to go to Mount Eliza to teach her kids for one hour, and then I'd have to drive an hour back, so she always cooked me a meal. Um, her husband at the time thought I was having an affair with her because she was <laughs> giving me a meal every night. He, the funny, the funny thing is, the way things are work around is that he was actually Bruce Lee's senior student, a guy called William Chung, and uh, known as the in the seventies the deadliest man on earth. So uh, I, I might be willing to drive for work, but I'm not willing to uh, risk my life for <laughs> for romance. But um, I drove all over town uh, to help out kids, and basically. Um, the idea started with, you know, my values were really that every child deserves to feel confident in the way that they move their body. I believe that every child should have enough um, resolve that, so that if they f fail and fall down that they pick themselves up and they are able to go again. And that every child, given the right amount of time and the right amount of support, would be able to find a sport that they fall in love with and that that keeps them active for the rest of their life and so in turn they become participants in life and not spectators and that's a big thing that we push. So um, really I believe that my dream and you know is only as you know my idea is really is only as small as my dream and the amount of work that I was willing to put in and I was always a very big dreamer. So, as time went on, um, the, the concept grew. I, I started to work in a lot more different uh, places, uh, all around uh, Middle Park and Turak, and the, my base started to get a little bit, bit closer to home. Uh, I was also, at that time, working at Wesley College, running a gymnastics program, and so I realised that it wasn't being used on a Saturday afternoon, and one of the biggest struggles that I had when I was going out to children's houses, especially if it rained, you know, because if it wasn't raining, I could always take a child up the road to a park and you could be really creative in the way that you use that equipment. And now, you know, uh, 20 years later, you see a lot of personal trainers doing that. But I would do this with the kids back in the late 90s. But if it rained and there wasn't any space within the house where we could actually play and we, without knocking over valuables, I'd be left to sometimes using a hallway to try and work a child's strength. And I came up with a whole range of activities that um, enabled me to be very creative in the way that I did that, but it was really limiting. So I ended up bringing a lot of children to Wesley College on a weekend and they came to me. And from there I grew from a one-man operation to I think eventually I had six trainers helping me on a Saturday. And in order for 
the program to have the same level of consistency and flow from week to week, I would spend anywhere between two and four hours every Friday night sitting up and writing out every single, all of those 50 programs for all the different trainers for each of their kids, each uh, hour, so that there was a, as I said, so there was a consistency with the product. Um, As, the, as my uh, sort of operation grew, I needed to also grow the brand and the idea of the brand. And this is kind of where, uh, as I said, David Lee Roth comes back in. Um, I wanted to have a, a logo that represented obviously movement, but also that sense of freedom, uh, creativity, and unlimited potential. And one of the strongest images I have as a child is of David Lee Roth doing this massive straddle jump off the top of a drum riser at the start of every concert. The lights would be down, they'd start the drum beat to uh, running with the devil, and then he would leap and then the lights would come on and he'd be halfway through his jump and he'd be in this amazing straddle jump right at the start of the concert. It was a really powerful way to obviously kick off a concert. And that, the power of that image stuck with me and I ended up using that for my logo. A lot of people think that the logo is actually me, is it? And, but it isn't. It's not really anyone. The idea was uh, inspired by David Lee Roth, but the logo itself is purposely ambiguous. If you really look closely at it, you can't really tell if it's a boy or if it's a girl. You can't tell if they're sitting forwards or backwards. You can't even tell if they're jumping in the air or they're, or they're sitting on the ground and doing a, a, a straddle sit and stretch. And as I said, I did that on purpose so that it, each child would be able to put their own sort of interpretation on the logo and therefore it would be more accessible. Two other things about the logo is one, you'll notice that the, the, the person or the girl or the guy in the, in the logo, they're not pointing their toes. And again, that was done on purpose because we're not about perfection, we're more about fun and participation and confidence. So I didn't want to have this logo that was all about, you know, elite. It symbolized an elite sort of uh, program. And the other thing is that it kind of looks like the, the logo or the person in the logo has shoes on. And again, that's to give it a very casual, sort of outdoorsy, sort of adventure sort of feel to the, the logo and not have it as just this, um, rep, not have it represent just a competition in terms of, you know, the way that the person's um, working. Really the, the sign of the times and the fact that there was this need for children who weren't, didn't have dads or parents or, or the, the time in their life and you just noticed that everything that was fathers used to do in the, in the 70s and 80s, wash their car, you know, wash the dog, it was all being outsourced and I realised that, you know, um, after you know starting the program originally, that um, you know people were outsourcing you know somebody come in and teach their child how to ride a bike or how to kick a football and and, and I was I was more than happy to be the guy who would go and do that. So after a period of time, we grew out of Wesley. We were there for eight years, and we've been 15 years since inception. And eventually, we decided that we would, or I decided that I would take a risk. And again, we're always asking children to be adventurous, so I have to drink my own Kool-Aid in that way and you know, do the same thing. And I decided that, right, it was time to see if I could turn this program and make it into a full-time program. I wasn't sure whether I'd already saturated the market or not in terms of market share, but I was willing to take that risk. This was back in 2011, 2012, or was at the heart of the time of the American recession. So banks were very careful in lending out money. I actually, one of the clients I taught, his autistic son who was about 16, his dad was the head of the Commonwealth Bank. And even though I went to the Commonwealth Bank and the three other top banks, none of the banks would lend me any money or believed in my idea or the dream. So at that time I was completely shattered because I thought, well, this, that's it, I'm not gonna be able to do it. But uh, again, like we say to the kids, get knocked down, pick yourself up, find another way to do it, do it again, never give up on your dream. So 
What I ended up having to do was I sold my uh, apartment at the time and I moved into this warehouse um, which didn't have a shower or a kitchen or anything like that and I slept on a mattress and it was great just the other day when we won the Small Business Award a buddy of mine sent me a, a wonderful text and it was really saying you know um, congratulations you know I remember back when you were you know sleeping on a mattress and uh, living off toast and saying to yourself oh my god what have I done <laughs> and uh, you know the program I'm really glad that we you know I obviously took that risk and it's you know and I have faith in myself and faith in you know what we stood for and the vision that it would grow and other people would you know get on board and see what we were doing and um, you know I mean it, I won't lie it wasn't easy you know um, living here for those four years in, in kind of isolation and being here 24 7 but it sure was an adventure I kind of felt like at the time I was a bit like Ang uh, LB Mangles you know when he's on the boat in those National Geographic you know uh, TV series and he's out there and everything he needs is just within reach he's got his, his map and he's got his book and he's got his cup of tea and everything and I felt a little bit like that for the first four and a half years because you know my whole life was confined to a very small room um, but again it's all about adventure and as we say on the front um, doors of the studio beyond these doors where you know we're invoking the spirit of adventure and the art of movement and that's really what we're doing and um, you know it's been probably the most exhilarating and, and scary ride that I've ever gone on but um, been a hell of a ride and I've loved every step of it and our, my goal for the future is just to try and continue to do it better and to inspire as many kids as we can and that's how and why I started the business. Cheers.